handle the truth. The Denise Simon Experience. The Truth Matrix. Vetting, exposing, drilling down to the truth. Rolling Thunder, this is Hitman, Seattle. Hitman, this is Rolling Thunder, Seattle. The Denise Simon Experience. Exposing politics, lies, demagoguery, spin, fraud. Great to suppress, Mike Charlie, 435-921. Great to mark, Mike Charlie, 4 7 3 9 8 9 out. Promoting individual situational awareness. Question, probe, notice, ask why. Simon Experience. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Denise Simon Experience. Uh, I get the d- d- distinct pleasure sometimes of um, getting to talk about something that's positive and happy and good. And this is one of those moments. Um, I, ha- I have the honor of uh, John Tamney with us. Now, John is the uh, author of um, Popular Economics and Who Needs the Fed? He also is the director uh, for the Center of Economic Freedom at Freedom Works and the editor at RealClearMarkets.com. Uh, his, his resume kind of keeps going on and on and on, but um, he's got a new book, and we're going to discuss that. So, John, um, thanks for being with us on the Denise Simon Experience. Hey, Denise, thank you so much for having me on. Great to be here. No, uh, when I when I got the heads up in the in the email, I was like, oh gosh. There's hope for me, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, the reason is is because your book, "The End of Work: um, Why Your Passion Can Become Your Job," is just about where I think a lot of people are, regardless really of what their age is, and they probably don't know it. They don't know that they can have a passion. Um, and they can actually be their job, but if it's their passion, it's really not a job. And you open the book with with an awful lot of football analogies, and and I was really thought I thought I was going to be, um, you know, doing a, a whole thing on football because that that part was pretty cool. Uh, but you you make a good argument there that if people realize what their passions are. Um, their life could be uh, very, very happy going down the road. But how do you know what your passion is, John? Well, you know, it's a great question, and, and I'm not saying it's easy. This book doesn't just have an easy answer because I think happiness is a challenge, but it's essential, and I think people are only happy if they're working hard. My contention, however, is that no one lacks work ethic. No one lacks intelligence. Everyone is good at something. Everyone listening is probably very good at a number of things, but there are a lot of people who wonder how to apply this book to their real lives because they've got, shall I say, a 20th century definition of work. It's not reasonable to many people to say, I'm going to make a career out of my love of football or my love of food or my love of wine or my love of shopping or my love of video games, but that's what we're seeing today. I contend to anyone listening, if you have got a passion, I guarantee you, very nearly guarantee you that there are jobs and remunerative jobs that reflect that passion. That's the world we live in today. So I'm trying to get people to not just look for different forms of work, work, but to think in different ways to realize that there are things out there that would elevate your unique charisma and your unique intelligence, but you have to find them. Um, I like that, and and so you're really arguing in in part of that that millennials um, will be the richest generation. So, as a caveat to that, how then, John, uh, can you can you make that argument? Um, because a lot of millennials are lazy. Uh, they <laughs> have kind of a weird work ethic, if a work ethic, and then they got all these student loans because they've been told you got to go to college, got to go to college, got to go to college. Well, I would say about the the laziness aspect is that if you go throughout history, 
you can go back to the to the nineteenth century and it was said about young people then that they were lazy, uh totally narcissistic, full of themselves. One writer at the toward the end of the nineteenth century said social will never work in the United States and it won't because the young young Americans are so into themselves that they would never work for others. They're imbeciles. And this was said about the 19th century. This was said about the young people who are going to father, who are set to father the greatest generation. And so realize that when we talk down about millennials, that's what was said about every generation. I'm from Generation X. Um, my generation was set to fold shirts at the Gap for life. There were movies made about us called Slacker, Reality Bites, Singles, all about how we were going to live in our parents' basements. And so this is something that's been said about every young generation, but every generation gets really rich simply because they're closest to the technology that enables great wealth creation. The knowledge possessed by millennials is endless. The knowledge that they have of technology that brings buyer and seller together is endless. Combine that with the fact that they'll be the first generation to be able to combine what they love with a job, and what you're going to see is actually a very hardworking generation creating enormous wealth. Okay, but John, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here with you. Oh. <laughs> So they don't have to vacuum because we have the rumba. Um, they, uh, their entertainment, they don't have to get in the car and go anywhere because they can just go to their smartphone and, and you know, watch Netflix. Um, they don't have to cook anything because that can be delivered by HelloFresh. Give me a break, John. <laughs> well, you put it, you put it so well, and, and, I, know, and, and I know you're – the devil's advocate. That's what they said about you when you were young. Look at how easy you and I had it relative to our parents, how easy our parents had it relative to their parents. What people are describing, what, what they're unwittingly saying when they bemoan these millennials who just sit there on their phones and have the world come to them by tapping on their phone is they're actually talking about progress. They're talking about a very happy story. That millennials don't have to do a lot of things precisely because we progress so much economically. And but yet that's they can also actually get a lot of things done because of technology. Of course they can. And, and, and what's got to be yeah, remembered is, is that the people listening, mark my words, you hit it on the head, Denise, in talking about how much we can get done in a short time. We are on the verge of a four-day work week. It's so obvious, and the reason we are is this technology that scares people, these robots, this automation. They are going to make us so much more productive that the four-day work week is going to become the norm, and that's exciting. And with that, the demand among people for entertainment is going to explode. And this means that the range of jobs that people never imagined before is set to explode. We have people today who are paid to play video games. And they are simply because the, one of the most watched sports in the world today is video game playing. Um, so, John, here, here's, a, here's a big question then. Technology is advancing, advancing very fast. And now we're in a competition with China, meaning the United States, on who's going to control 5G. And we're seeing mergers, you know, with the telephone companies and the tech companies because of 5G. Uh, which tells you that everything's going to be streaming at some point, everything. And so as a consequence, technology is advancing very fast, and it's replacing parts of industry. So are you then arguing that parts of industry will be replaced, yet because uh, of technology and its speed, it's actually creating a new and wider frontier? Absolutely. You put it very well. Yes, the technology, as, as you exactly put it, is expanding and advancing faster than ever, and workers should love this. Let me explain why. Let's go back 150 years. If you and I, and I were born 150 years ago, we would know almost beyond a shadow of a doubt what we were going to do for the rest of our lives. We were going to farm. That was the future. There was really no choice in the matter. And then two robots came along, the backhoe and the tractor, easily the biggest job destroyers in the history of mankind. You could argue that they destroyed billions of jobs, if not hundreds and hundreds of millions. But did they put people into bread lines? No, they just freed people up to express their talents in far more remunerative 
ways and in ways that were much more associated with their skills. Think, of, I, I can't speak for you, but if I had to work on a farm, I would be lazy and I would be an object of pity. People would laugh at me. But thanks to the robot that was the tractor, I did not have to do that. I was freed up to do other things. And so these technologies that people were, yes, they are, are they going to erase jobs behind the counter at McDonald's? And I'm not knocking that. Are they going to erase truck driving jobs? Without question. But then that's the historical norm. And what that means, it doesn't mean that people are going to be out of work. Robots aren't going to put us out of work as much as they are going to enable more and more of us to get up in the morning and say, ah, I'm going to work, and at work is where I'm an expert. That's where I get to showcase my expertise. Because all the drudgery will have been erased, we can focus more and more on what we do best. Um, we just finished the uh, Kentucky Derby, and one of the owners of the uh, top horse in the Kentucky Derby, not only was former military, but when he got out of the military, he created a company that provided scaffolding for the Navy. And he sold the company for $73 million and then decided that he was going to go into the horse business. So here's a guy, fairly young, I might add, uh, that's already had several careers so he and and it seemed like he had like you say more than one passion and he found opportunities to apply those passions and made money at it right is that endorsing yep. your argument oh it certainly is the ways in which we can get rich today the ways in which we can work today are endless let's just look at something as basic as food in the 1970s and this is true in the 1980s too if you had told people, yeah, I'm going to go work at a restaurant as a cook or a chef, people kind of assumed, oh, uh, something bad happened. You couldn't complete your degree. Um, you so, Something's wrong there. Fast forward to, to 2018, becoming a chef today is not only a reasonable path, it's something that people choose among being a doctor, lawyer, investment banker. It wasn't even a professional classification back then, whereas nowadays there are pastry chefs, there are coffee directors at restaurants whose sole focus is on designing coffee. For, and the point is, is that people who want to, who've got interests and passions, they can pursue it and they can achieve at a high level quickly and they can move on. They can start different businesses. You can create wealth much more quickly today, but you can also get good at a certain business or a certain uh, vocation much, much more quickly today. And the better yet, there's an opportunity to do that. Again, 40 years ago, if you became a chef, you'd failed. Nowadays, it's something that people do, and they do credibly. So you are you, – you said a lot there, John, and that is that um, typically like a blue collar, at some point if you were a cook, something that moved into a chef, uh, necessarily in the category of a blue collar um, worker, if you will, versus a keyboard job, meaning anything that has to do with technology or, you know, your fingertips. So between that spectrum, uh, there's a lot of pride because there's, there's pride in production, whether it's, it's on the farm, whether it's, you know, scaffolding, or whether it's in some kind of uh, tech space. So how are you imparting um, how to gain the knowledge of what your passion is or passions, plural? Well, I, I like what you say about the, the pride in production because it, 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 I'm, I'm, it gets to an, an essential point here, and, and it brings us back to food as, as I answer your question in total. I know chefs in Washington, D.C., and this makes me so sad to think about, but who used to be embarrassed because their kids were embarrassed to tell their friends what their father did. And now their kids are so happy and proud to say what their father does. I don't know how this is going to come off, but I know an economist in Washington, D.C., who basically broke the bank to take his family on a Christmas vacation to some kind of Caribbean place. And he saw a man there throughout the week just covered in tattoos. And he thought, and he, okay, take this as you will. He thought, why is that guy here too? Turns out this guy's a chef. This was something you couldn't do long ago. Now people can do jobs that were seen as blue collar in the past and they are venerated for doing it and they earn lots of money. 
and they and and they are they are looked up to. And so I hope that's a way of answering your question. That for one, so much of what was seen as manual and blue collar in the past is is now looked up to, which I think is exciting. The ability for more and more people of different backgrounds and educational attainments to achieve is much much greater today. Now, in terms of finding it, I'll be. I, there's a chapter in the book about me. It took me a while. I worked on Wall Street for a time. I couldn't work hard there. I didn't understand why people loved it so much because I didn't. I had all sorts of different jobs. I fund, fundraised for years, and I still do it to pay the bills so that I could write. For me to write, I can work weekends. It's nothing for me to work all weekend writing because I love what I do. But it took me a while to get to this point, and I had to take other jobs to pay the bills so that I could be a writer. And so I'm not saying you're going to find your passion tomorrow. But think about it. Work different jobs. Learn from the different jobs. You will find your passion, and I guarantee your passion will be remunerative. Um, now, your book isn't easy. It's not a very long book, and it's an easy book to read, and it's a fun book to read because you you are um, you are imparting some, um, I I would say, real hope and some real dreams, and you're you're telling people you don't have to just follow these rules all the time that are are spoken and unspoken, taught and untaught. Um, so the, as a consequence. On. And and I, this this might be the segue to that, and that's education. Is education keeping pace, um, or can it ever be ahead of these trends to address the speed of the future and global competition? When I say speed of the future, we don't the speed is so fast we don't necessarily know what the future looks like. So can education, or is education even beginning to address that? Uh, Denise, it's a great question, and my answer is no. Um, uh-huh, if good answer. College, <laughs> if college professors knew what the future was going to look like, if they even had a clue, they wouldn't be college professors. They'd be billionaires. And so this is my way of saying – I'm not saying people shouldn't go to college. There's lots of reasons that people go to college. But just as we would look askance at someone for saying to someone, well, you can't make it because you're a woman or because you're black or because you're from the wrong neighborhood, I think this notion of you can't make it because you lack a college degree is every bit as offensive and should be looked down every bit as much as these other forms of, let's just call it, um, these other isms that we dislike. The simple truth is we live in a world in which it doesn't matter what your background is. What matters is your willingness to work hard. You look at a country like China, it's one of the least educated countries in the world. People are getting rich there today not because they're well-educated, but because they're finally free. South Korea was one of the most illiterate countries on earth until not too long ago. It's rich today because the people are free. In the U.S., some will go to college, some won't, but that will not hold you back. The only thing that will hold you back is a failure to find that which animates your unique skills, and you don't need to go to college for that. So don't ever let anyone tell you because you're not good at algebra or because you have no interest in college that you cannot achieve. That is false, and you will prove them wrong. Um, but beyond college, if we kind of back it up several years – you, I think your message um, is needs to be planted even in middle school to high school, such that the syllabus, um, in competition with what what it is today, like with the Common Core, is missing a, a thousands of of um, doors that you know it could be music, it could be. Um, construction, it could be welding, it could be mechanics. I mean, all of those things are still necessary in life, but they're 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 out of education. So you have to kind of go find it on your own. Um, so if it's planted in middle school slash high school in redoing the syllabus, then you necessarily know that you you don't necessarily need college. Or if you go to college, it might be more of a trade, right? trade school? Yeah, no, no, I think, I think you're right. But I would also say um, you, you've already hit it on the head. There's just some things that you can't teach. Um, so if you look at the Beatles, if you look at the Beach Boys, uh, they never read a note of music. They don't know how to. Uh, John Cougar Mellencamp has freely acknowledged that he's never read a note of music. 
What's important, once again, is freedom. I don't think schools can teach this stuff. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, my view, and, and some will take offense to this, is I think school, I'm not against it, but I feel to some degree like it's daycare. Um, if, if, if schools could see the future, if they could see the jobs of the future, once again, they probably wouldn't be teaching in schools. And so more my thing is, is I want to communicate to parents that if you have a child that seems unfocused in school, don't give up on that person. Don't presume because school, the traditional math, science, history, because those courses don't uh, get your child excited, that somehow this, this, this individual lacks a future. That is wildly false. I guarantee that child is good at all sorts of things. And what's exciting is this child is living in a time and place in which what impassions you, what gets you excited each day can can turn into a career. I mean, there are so many examples in the book, but the NBA just staged a draft, not for players, but for video game players. There, it's called the NBA 2K League. The starting pay is thirty-five thousand. You get a housing stipend, a relocation bonus. Kids who love video games, playing them, now can earn in the millions of dollars per year. There's a new profession out there called video game coach. People literally make 50000 plus a year coaching players of video games. And so my point is, let's not limit kids anymore. Let's not let them be discouraged by what they don't know. Let's encourage what they do know and tell them to focus on that. Um, your book is almost a commencement speech. And I would say, regardless of age, um, you know, you could be in the ninth grade or you could be a 45-year-old parent. So um, you've got a commencement speech and yet you've got a parenting message in your book. So uh, there isn't an age group or there isn't a reader profile that should really be exempt from reading your book. Did I get that right? Denise, you nailed it. Uh, you make my day. Um, that's exactly... Oh. The, 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 that's exactly the point of this. I want I want this book in parents' hands because I want them to not lose hope just because their kids aren't good at school or just because they are. It's more about what you, you're being able to find, what gets you excited to wake up every day. And it's for people of all ages. I did not find my passion in life until I was in my mid-30s. I had all sorts of failure on the way to finding what I think is success. And for me, success is getting up every day, dying to go to work. But it took me a while to find that. I really thought I was lazy. And I realized I wasn't lazy. I was just doing the wrong thing. What I always wanted to do was to write about economics and economic policy and write books. Now I work immensely hard because I love what I do. And so this is for everyone. We thankfully live in a time and place that you can become what you envision. You can turn your passion, yes, into a job. So if you were sitting on a panel before Congress, um, would you say to members of Congress that government is in the way of a lot of people that are trying to achieve something that they uh, what would lead to their passion? Uh, yes, I would say that, and I would say this to Democrats and Republicans, because everyone's got an opinion about what government does that they don't like or, that, or what government spends on that they don't like. My point is that, big, is that government overall gets in the way, simply because government spending gets in the way of progress. Um, you look at something as basic as the smartphone. The original mobile phone cost $4,000. And it was in a very few. You remember that? And so I do. I was one. I, I do. I so do. I think back to that. I remember I grew up in California, and <clears throat> we saw someone once in Beverly Hills who had one, and and we looked in awe, like, "Who is this? Who's this famous person with a phone?" That person did something essential. Th those were venture buyers, which I talk about in the book. They bought something and they created a market for it, and then gradually entrepreneurs came in. Now we have exponentially greater phones that can do all sorts of things. Okay for a tiny fraction of the cost. My point is, is look at the kind of jobs, the advances that create. Look at what the yeah. mobile phone has well meant for everyone. A <laughs> point well taken. <laughs> exactly and, right. And so we need this crazy spending. We need the rich to be not just investing, but buying things. The first laser printer cost $17,000. The first computer cost a million. But thanks to these original buyers, 
who created a market, now we get computers for next to nothing. And think of all the businesses built on passion yeah. that were created by the smartphone and the computer. And so I'm not making a partisan statement. I'm making merely a statement when, that when people get to keep more of their money, all these innovation. different products, find these innovation. innovations find their way to us that enable us to pursue jobs that are ref reflective of our passions. Well, congratulations, John Tamney, on the book, The End of Work, Why Your Passion Can Become Your Job. Well done, and so happy to have this conversation. I hope you'll come back because there's a lot more to, to cover. And um, so thank you, John, for being with us. And ladies and gentlemen, stay with us because there's more coming your way. Hi, this is Captain Matt Bruce from the Captain's America Third Watch, and you're listening to Talk America Radio, the new dominant force in conservative talk radio. Hi, this is Donna Fiducia. And Don Newen from Cowboy Logic Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't go to sleep every night completely fatigued from trying to restore America from the destruction that is taking place, then you're simply not doing enough. Join us every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, for Cowboy Logic Radio. Let the restoration begin. Donald Trump came to Washington vowing to drain the swamp and make government work for the American people. But the swamp creatures in D.C. aren't going down without a fight, and the deep state is determined to overturn the election and keep their gravy train rolling. In these turbulent times, it's critical for patriots to stay engaged and be prepared to defend this president. You can stay up to date on Trump's battle to make America great again by listening to America First Radio with Jim Dawes each weeknight at 10 p.m. Eastern on the Liberty Feed. Hi, it's Mark Walters from Armed American Radio. You know, for nearly a decade, I've been educating, informing, and entertaining responsibly armed Americans. And during that time together, we've shared some ups and downs, haven't we? Trump's election saved our Supreme Court, and no doubt the future of our gun rights for now. But now is not the time to lay down. The enemies of freedom are well-funded and more determined than ever. To keep up with the state of your gun rights, make sure to tune in to Armed American Radio right here on Talk America Radio, the new dominant voice in conservative talk radio. You're listening to your local news source, WLBB, News Talk 1330 and FM 106.3. ATA Digital Dallas, Talk America Radio, simulcasting on WDDQ, Talk 92.1 Adel Valdosta, Georgia, and WJHC, Talk 107.5 Jasper, Florida. And thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Very happy that um, you could uh, stay with us. Um, I got Seat Motley with us, a previous guest here on the Denise Simon Experience, and he is president and founder of lessgovernment.org. And um, uh, we're not going to talk about uh, Stormy Daniels, and we're not going to talk about the Russians. Well, maybe we might, but um, <laughs> we're not going <laughs> to we're not going to talk about Robert Mueller and all this other stupidness that was going on. But there is stupidness going on, so Seton's going to explain it all to us. And I would say it has everything to do with the internet. So, with that, welcome Seton to you and Rufus, uh, your company in the background. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I like the way you, you wrote an article yesterday for a Red State, and I really like the way that you framed it because you were really driving the point home on what is happening with free speech, communications, the Internet, websites, regulations, uh, what kind of gets pushed up to the top to be headlines, what kind of gets pushed down to the bottom, and what kind of gets just kind of ignored altogether. So with that... <clears throat> Start, if you would, with uh, Mr. Lloyd. Yeah, Mark Lloyd, that was actually a very helpful dis uh, dis 
discovery. Um, I was at the Media Research Center in 2009, and a buddy of mine who worked not for the Media Research Center but for another joint Brent Mozell was involved with who started called the Parents Television Council emailed me something from an announcement about the Federal Communications Commission. I always give Dan Issa credit. He kicked it to me and said, you'll want to read about this guy because then you'll want to write about this guy. I said, okay. So I looked him up. Mark Lloyd had created the position of Chief Diversity Officer at the FCC, and their initial hire for that position, the, the position they created for this guy, Mark Lloyd, uh, was he's a radical uh, communities are radical. I call, it's what it's called, me, what we call media Marxists. They're Marxists in the media realm. This guy was insane, and I wrote about him, and that got me on Glenn Beck's television show about 12 times, and this guy was insane. This guy uh, wanted to set up like eight pods, eight government broadcasting pods, you know, PBS and NPR around the country, and to fund it, they would tax radio and television stations dollar for dollar their gross revenue for the year. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, he wanted to destroy all private communications so that only government would be the, 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 the media. Um, mm-hmm. And he was insane, and he was hired by the FCC, and thank goodness we exposed him because he probably would have done a lot more damage than he did had he not been highlighted, and um, he was there for about three or four years and then and then quietly left and joined the New America Foundation, which is a left wing think tank in d c but um so yeah i mean he was he was an indicator of where the very early on where the Obama, where we people who were paying attention already knew where the Obama administration was on private enterprise versus public enterprise, and that of course includes. Um, media and communications, and, and as you as you pointed out in the intro, uh, the internet is, is the is the chief form of communication at this point. I would I would argue, um, and so that's why you know what what began in 2009 at the FCC, the Obama FCC, with a Mark Lloyd hire, uh, begat in 2015 the the Barack Obama administration taking over one sixth of the internet regulatorily uh with this under the guise of net neutrality, network neutrality. Uh which was basically, you know, there you have quotes from Marxists. So there's a guy there's another group like the New America Foundation called the uh called Free Press. And they don't do anything but tech policy and communications policy. That's all they do. New America does a bunch of leftist stuff. Free Press is tech specific. They were co founded by a college professor and an avowed Marxist please pardon the redundancy, named Robert McChesney. And one of his many very obviously Marxist quotes is, the object, the, the object of the ultimate goal of net neutrality, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it in front of me, the ultimate goal of net neutrality is to eradicate the media capitalists of the phone and cable companies and to divest them from control. Well, that's nearly identical to what, Lloyd wants to do regulatorily uh-huh. with uh-huh. with the hundred percent taxes on their you know hundred percent gross revenue taxes and stuff is is net neutrality is for the internet what Mark Lloyd was had plotted for radio and television stations around the country it was uh-huh. to use the hammer of government to obliterate them out of existence and leave you with government as your sole radio station, your sole television station, and your sole internet service provider. And that's what that's what net neutrality was. And and it is. It still is. And he and and part of the importance of the quote is the full quote about net neutrality from this guy McChesney is we're not at that stage yet. But ultimately that's the objective. Meaning Net neutrality today is not going to be net neutrality tomorrow. It's just, uh, that's why it's so amorphous. It's why it's undefinable. That's why it constantly shifts in what it means. It, it's intended to grow and grow and grow and allow government to grow and grow and grow in, on the Internet to, to, to ultimately – to where it's ultimately the only thing on the internet is government content. Well, I would argue that is where all the telecom companies are going because of uh, 5G and who is necessarily, um, that's why you're seeing some of these 
tech companies, uh, these cable companies, they're buying into each other um, and merging because they got to compete with China, who China wants to, and speaking of red, they want to have the, you know, they want to be the top, you know, um, manager of global 5G. On the, on the converse side of that, um, we're seeing some of these activities, I think, that are happening on a very kind of a creeping basis. And, uh, you know, we, we are certainly seeing that with Facebook, um, where they're controlling. Um, and I remember, you know, that discussion with, uh, that, uh, when you were with um, uh, Glenn Beck, because there was a time that they actually thought that anybody that was a blogger would then have to apply to have a license. Remember that? Well, Remember this? That was, that was actually just in the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, but that was a uh, was the beginning of a movement, right? No, I I, I, I agree. But at the time, okay. it was just okay. the city of Philadelphia wanting to okay. register bloggers, mm -hmm. and and I, that was part of what I made fun of. Um, it's a world wide web. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have bloggers in Philadelphia register. That's a little absurd. Um, <laughs> but um, they were also gonna tax bloggers. Correct. Uh, and that was a Philadelphia specific thing as well. Uh, the, the home of liberty, ladies and gentlemen, Philadelphia. Um, but um, yeah, no, that's that's. But you're right. Of course, that was going to be the the that was the that was the canary in the coal mine. That was their dipping their toes in the water. And exactly. of course, we, pu we pushed back on that, and it didn't go anywhere in Philadelphia or anywhere else uh, to this to this point anyway. But um, yeah, you know, it's it's. This is another backdoor. This whole fake news thing is another backdoor way. Yes. To register content and and get a, a content approved. Yes. Um, I mean, the fact that Facebook uses Snopes as a fact checker is a joke. Or the fact that and, and Google they use the is using. Poverty law yeah, Center, yeah, 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 yeah. They use the Southern Poverty Law Law Center as some arbiter of who's not who is or is not a hate group is absurd. Um, look, I, I know Tony Perkins, the head of the Family Research Council. The moment the, S, the Southern Poverty Law Center put them on the hate group list, I'm like, that's just ridiculous. Tony Perkins is a perfectly go good man, a perfectly reasonable gentleman, a perfectly nice guy, and, and, this, and there's nothing to do with it. And then, of course, ultimately that, that listing by the Southern Poverty Law Center led that moron to go in there with Chick-fil-A sandwiches and shoot up the place. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, shoot up the fam the family research center council. Um, but, uh, shot a, shot a security guard and then shot him, uh, who shot the insane person. So yeah, this is all of the same, you know, this goes back before you got the internet, you had the campaign finance reform movement, which was <laughs> trying to regulate speech. Yes. Um, and you know, my initial reaction to anything like that is I don't want elected officials limiting what I can say to unelect them. Um, that's, which is what campaign finance is for. It's the, you know, it's, it's elected officials shutting up their pr prospective opponents. That's what it is. Um, so, and, and then this is just, as the technology has evolved, has evolved, the movement has evolved, but the underlying mm -hmm. uh, uh, the underlying principles and efforts haven't changed. It's just the technology has, so they're applying their principles, their awful, terrible principles, to the new platforms. And so now we have a, a new problem with this, <clears throat> right, Seton, and that is who gets to define what speech is and then what hate speech is. Right. And, then, and, uh, and, and as I've said nine million times on social media and on the radio, hate speech is speech. You mm -hmm. can't regulate it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's speech. You know, you, 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 just because you've added an adjective doesn't change the noun. Mm -hmm. And and you know it's it's who who watches the watchers right you know um, that's always the question and you you're always you know once you start watching you can't stop watching because mm -hmm. you got to watch the watchers then you got to watch the watchers who are watching the watchers then you got to watch the watchers you know and this goes on forever the 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 point of the First Amendment was 
Everybody talks, everybody, and, and everybody, everybody just listens and decides for themselves. Life is deciding. And that's the whole point of this is we, the people, are supposed to be able to say whatever the heck we want, completely free from government interference or imposition. And then, you know, it's caveat emptor. Let the, let the listener, you know, I don't know, let the, I, used, I looked it up once, what the word listener means <laughs> rather than buyer um, in Latin. But um, you know, let the let the listener beware. Like, you know, you 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 consume all this information, and some of it's good and some of it's bad. And you decide for yourself what you know. The fact that you want to outsource your thinking to the Silicon Valley just shows you aren't thinking very much. Well, and here's what's happening already, because we already know that Facebook uh, puts people in jail and Twitter puts people in jail. So then, and not what just happens? In jail, even more surreptitiously and more obnoxiously, they don't jail them. They don't officially say, hey, you're banned or you're on suspension for 30 days or whatever. They shadow ban them. They don't tell them. They just move, they change their particular alg algorithm and Correct. move them down the food chain so that nobody sees what they're saying. Correct. They're not banned. They're still posting. They haven't been notified about anything. They're just not being seen by anybody. And then what happens? Because we know this is happening. Then you become self-censoring, don't you? Well, that's the that's the that's that's why the the reaction to Kanye West is so telling. Correct. You know, for for idiot uh, Maxine Waters, and she is low IQ. I I don't have to test her to find that out. Um, <laughs> for her to say that Kanye West, quote unquote, spoke out of turn. You have a government official deciding when and when it's your turn to speak. I don't think so. I don't. I don't think so at all. Um, and that's that's part of why what Kanye West did is so telling is because you know their reaction to his you know it's it's partially racial for sure. He's a black guy who's now an Uncle Tom or you know whatever uh, House N or whatever they want to call him. It's also just in general the fact that any minority group, any artist, you know, any any person from Hollywood or music is speaking anything other than leftist nostrums is is awful. Um, it's it's all of that, and you know, I, I thought of this the other day. You know, as a as a musician and never sold records, and I was I was actually intending if I sold records to use my platform to say, hey, my taxes on my royalties are too high. I was going to transition that way. Um, but it, what would be more? What would be more? You know, uh, counterculture. What would be more rock and roll? What would be more punk rock in this day and age? than for a Hollywood actor or a musician to come out and be a free market conservative. There are some I mean, out there. But what I'm saying is to come out publicly and say, you know, do what Kanye West is doing. And God bless him, he doubled down. He got pressure and he kept pushing. He, it was very Donald Trump of him. Um, but, but my point is, you know, these people want to be, you know, you know everybody's, everybody's uh, uh, so unique that they all have their left ear pierced. You know, I, I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's, the conformity of the of the alleged nonconformists is hysterical, and right now the the most punk rock thing you can do is to come out and say, hey, you know, I, I think taxes are too high. We should we should shrink the government a good deal, um, and 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 that that would be the most you know counterculture thing of all to do in Hollywood, and and and, and the fact that more people don't do that. Um, is one because they're stupid. They don't understand. They don't know politics. They don't understand what's going on on the planet. But two, like you said, they're cowed. They they don't want to say. Look, there there was a very popular show for four or five or six years. Uh, in no, I mean, it was a good show, but it was in no small part because it immediately followed Magnum PI on Thursday nights on CBS. It was called Simon and Simon, and it was about oh, two yeah. brothers. And one of the actors was a blonde guy, good looking guy named Jameson Parker. He never, he fell off the face of the planet after Simon and Simon. Why? Because he was on the board of the NRA, and he wasn't a big enough star to 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 overcome the 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 blacklisting he received in Hollywood. You know, Tom Selleck can say whatever the heck he wants. Right. Clint Eastwood can say whatever the heck he wants because right. they're so big, they're untouchable. 
But a Jamison Parker, I don't even know. You know, I'd have, have to look him up on IMDb to see what he did after Simon and Simon. I mean, to, to have a network show successful for more than half a decade and then just fall off the planet. His mm-hmm. his his co-star J- uh, Gerald McGrady has been in a bunch of stuff. He had another hit show with Major Dad with Delta Burke, and then he's been in a bunch of movies. And he was on West Wing, and he's had a you know a very lo- you know substantive career after Simon and Simon. And Jameson Parker fell off the planet. The difference was Gerald McGrady wasn't on the board of the, of the NRA. So you know it's it, that's why you know that's to silence them. You know, you, you, you get, and that, that's one of the reasons Trump won, is because when he comes out on, I tweeted he would win on his announcement day when he came down the escalator and, and swerved into illegal immigration. As soon as he swerved, I went, he just won the election. And then, I, you know, any hesitancy I had on that, uh, on that prediction, was when he got pushed back, because you knew, I was like, man, he's going to get crushed for saying this. And when he completely stood by what he said, I was like, oh, my God, this is a whole new thing. This is a whole – there's there's no, cowing go, there's no cowing going on. There's no cowering going on here. This is fabulous. And that's a large portion of why he won is because he did – you know, the, the Never Trumpers yell at us, oh, he fights back, he fights back. Yes, that's why we like him. He fights back. He's not cowering in a corner saying, please don't hurt me. He's, you know – that's, but, you know, not many, you know, he's a billionaire. He's been a very successful man. He's in his 70s. He has, you know, to, to, to borrow the, the, warp the phrase, he has screw you money. <laughs> you know, he can say screw you to whoever he wants. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's an unusual combination of characteristics that made Trump a successful, you know, novice presidential candidate. Uh, not a lot of these people. Not a lot of these people, especially in Hollywood and and and, uh, and music, and the entertainment arts, uh, have that have that combination of characteristics that allow them to do that. Now, see, let me ask you this question: When it comes to the FCC and net neutrality, because something is, I think, happening tomorrow at the White House on uh, May the tenth. And um, what is particularly curious for me is it's kind of a a tech summit. There are 38 companies that have represent representatives going to the White House. People like Google and Amazon, Facebook and yep. Microsoft. And there there are really two topics: regulations and artificial intelligence. What is their message to this White House? What 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 if if you were there? What do you think you would hear? Well, as far as AI, I think it's just going to be like an educational thing, and uh, Trump's people might give a little pushback on what this means from a jobs perspective, you know, going forward. Um, you know, I, I think it's like 20% of jobs in America are related to driving, and you know, which means if... I don't think I don't think we're as close to autonomous vehicles as a lot of other people do, but you know when when we get there, if we get there, that's it's almost twenty percent of America's jobs go away. You know that's that's problematic, um, but um, that's part of it. As far as the regulations are concerned, what the, what the groups that are going are worried about is the you know post Facebook. Uh, uh, data thing. Now all of a sudden, you've got these major companies that have been making two parallel arguments that make uh, no sense together. One is, you know, we're these geniuses and we have this amazing algorithms and we can do whatever. And then when it comes to, well, wait a minute, that's a lot of power, and perhaps we should have mm-hmm. some government oversight. Oh, we're just, you know, we're we're just a platform. We don't, you know, we can't control what people put on our platforms, but yes, they can, because as we know, they shadow yeah, they ban people. That's Google, right. Google, Google has changed their algorithms so that no gun advertisements can show up. They can control this stuff. Uh, it's just a matter of whether they want to. Now, I'm, I've reached the point now, and I've been about as anti-antitrust as anybody on the planet. They need to be regulated. 
Google, Facebook, Twitter. These companies need to be regulated. They are huge. Google's market cap is almost $800 billion. You know, we hear about, you talk about net neutrality and how the giant internet service provider companies can control speech and everything. You do, I, I say in response, you do realize Google could purchase every single internet service provider in the entire country mm-hmm. by themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, please do not give me the big corporation thing. And Google's funded the push for net neutrality for 15 years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one of the reasons being, it, you, we'll, we'll, we'll love this, is average guy, guys and girls paying a lot of money for Internet access. It, net neutrality would outlaw Internet providers from charging bandwidth hog companies like Google, like Facebook, like Microsoft, like Twitter, like Netflix, any money for the extra bandwidth they use. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there, that, there's only two groups of people the ISPs can charge, the big giant bandwidth hog companies, and or us. us. So under net neutrality, we'll be paying a lot more for Internet access to augment the profits exactly. of Google and Facebook. Exactly. And that's one of the things. And then what they're arguing now is this. I think this is in the, in the wake of the Facebook thing. They're going in there for another round of don't regulate us. I think that's and, what's... And I would say they're going to have a, a conversation to, to teach this White House what is happening when it comes to 5G. I think so, although given their brilliant, insightful ruling from the CFIUS from the, uh, the, mm-hmm. on, on, on yeah. um, the, yeah, the foreign yeah. company trying to buy um, Qualcomm, right. I think this White House is pretty informed on what's going on with 5G. Um, there you were know, some there that was, got there was it. There's a company called yeah. Broadcom, which is yep. in Singapore and has Chinese ties. And they were looking to buy Qualcomm. Qualcomm is driving our innovation on 5G. Yes. And Broadcom's famous for buying. They're, they're Gordon Gecko in, in Mandarin Chinese. They buy companies and break them up. And th- right now it's a race between us and uh, Qualcomm and Huawei. Or I think that's how you pronounce it. It's a Chinese company. Correct. Those are the two companies vying for leadership on 5G. Correct. And right Correct. now we're in the lead. Qualcomm is in the lead, thank God. Uh, if Broadcom had successfully purchased the company and broken it up, the, the, it was, there would only be one company left standing. And that would be China's Huawei. And then China gets to set the parameters. It's actually so I don't think the White House Huawei? is as dumb on this as, as some people do. Well, I hope, I hope you're right. But, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've been speaking with Seton uh, Motley. And um, we have these conversations from time to time when it comes to net neutrality, uh, free speech, and all those other kinds of things. Check out his article on um, Red State or certainly go visit lessduckgovernment.org. And good work because I think that you know this discussion is hardly over, Seton, obviously, because you've got 38 representatives hitting the White House um, to have yeah. these discussions. So, no, these, uh, these as, as William F. Buckley said, there are no permanent victories and there are no permanent defeats. So, yeah. <laughs> well said. Well said. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thanks for your time and come back again soon. And ladies and gentlemen, there's more coming your way. You can't handle the truth. Denise Simon Experience. The Truth Matrix. Vetting, exposing, drilling down to the truth. Rolling Thunder, this is Hitman, Seat Over. Hitman, this is Rolling Thunder, Seat Out. The Denise Simon Experience. Exposing politics, lies, demagoguery, spin, fraud. Suppress Mike Charlie four three five nine or two one. Great to mark Mike Charlie four seven three nine or eight nine or out. Promoting individual situational awareness. Question, probe, notice, ask why. Mark smoke on the deck. Two rounds HEPT. Cast TOT five three. Simon experience. Hey there, ladies.
ladies and gentlemen, we're here to talk about how mad everybody is at the Senate and the Senate leadership. So, uh, my good friend um, Rachel Bovard's with us for the Conservative Initiative, um, Conservative Partnership Initiative. Don't why I can't get that right in my mind yet. But um, you can just say CPI; it's fine. <laughs> okay, good. CPI. Thank you, thank you. And um, <laughs> Rachel's on a terror. It seems like my last guest, Seton Motley, he was on the same terror, but um, <laughs> on a whole different topic when it came to net neutrality but here we're going to talk about the senate you know first we hated harry reed for all that kind of stuff that was going on in the senate we kept saying oh well the house is doing a lot of good work but when other things go over to the senate it just falls on the floor we're right back in there aren't we aren't we rachel we really are and what's ironic about it is that mitch mcconnell in 2015 when republicans took over the senate made a big speech about how he was going to reform the senate it was going to be much more open there was going to be a big process uh, you know, now that Reed was gone. And in reality, he simply perpetuated a lot of Harry Reid's, uh, you know, processes in running the Senate in an autocratic way. I mean, they, the Senate has, has had one amendment vote this entire year. So that pretty much speaks for itself. And what is particularly fascinating is by default, he's giving the Democrats a lot of uh, sway. He's giving them a lot more power than they necessarily deserve. So the, so you know, a lot of their posturing and a lot of their nonsense ends up being a headline when it shouldn't be, right? No, I think that's exactly right. And that's particularly true when it comes to confirming Trump's nominees. You know, Democrats are reflexively opposing these nominees, no matter what their qualifications are. They oppose them because they were nominated by Trump, and that's the only reason. Uh, But in reality, their obstruction is only happening because McConnell is letting the Republicans get or letting Democrats get away with it. You know, they are stretching the Senate rules to their breaking point uh, to obstruct these nominees. And McConnell has room within the rules to punch back and make them feel pain for doing that. But he's choosing not to do so. And the result is that he's allowing Democrats to get away with murder, essentially. Has this been really a uh, timing decision on him, um, given that we're in a midterm election year, uh, such that maybe he'll find some steelness in in uh, 2019 ha, ha, ha. i'm trying to look <laughs> i'm trying uh, yeah. to be positive I mean, come on from here <laughs> one would hope although i will say if there was going to be any point to put the screws to democrats it would be this year right because yeah. he could be keeping them in session he could be keeping them over the weekend but instead he's letting them go home and campaign the senate literally works two and a half days a week they come in monday night they adjourn early Thursday afternoon, and the result is Democrats get to go home and have four extra days in the campaign trail that they would otherwise not have if McConnell just kept the Senate in session. And this is a big deal this midterm because, as you know, there are 26 Senate Democrats up for re-election and only six Republicans are running for re-election. So it's in our interest to keep the Senate in session, keep them in town and off the campaign trail, but McConnell can't seem to manage that. Uh, So we have people like uh, Dick Durbin... We got Diane Feinstein, we got Cory Booker, Kamala Harris. All of these people are really getting away with murder here. I mean, uh, you know, as far as if you listen to any of these confirmation hearings and you have to kind of, you know, have the patience to go listen to some of these confirmation hearings, they they are given these talking points. They all ask the same questions and just, you know, in different order and you know, they change one word out, but they're on a full-blown assault of anybody um, that Trump has nominated for positions on confirmation. And I would argue that, you know, Iran, <laughs> that was supposed to be a big, huge problem getting out of this deal. And, and uh, the Mueller thing, that's supposed to be getting in the way of, of the Trump administration. But McConnell's actually kind of getting in the way of advancing the Trump agenda, correct? Yeah, I mean, the Senate really has not been helpful, right? We, we saw them tank Obamacare repeal. Uh, we've seen them fail to address DACA or immigration reform, and they've actively taken measures to block Trump from getting his border wall funded. Uh, so to the extent that the Senate has stepped in and said, you know, we're going to deliver for the president where we can, they have utterly failed on that minus tax reform and, you know, confirming uh, judicial nominees to some extent. But that's it. That's all they have to tell when they go home on the campaign trail. And that's not you know, what a unified government. We all thought we were going to get a lot more out of that than what we've seen so far. All right. Well, one thing that you argue, Rachel, and I'm um, agreeing with it, and I want you to explain it to the listeners because a lot of people just don't understand these Senate rules, but um, we have this debate thing. 
this 30 hour debate thing. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, so this is uh, Senate Rule 22. And basically what it says is that once cloture is invoked, so once the filibuster is overcome, uh, you so the Senate has a maximum of 30 hours to debate before voting on final passage or confirmation of the nominee. What has been happening is that Democrats are taking full advantage of that. They are saying we are demanding all 30 hours of debate time. However, none of them actually come to the floor and debate. And that's why when you turn on C-SPAN, all you see is an empty Senate floor because none of the senators, the Democrat senators, you know, they've demanded this time, but then they're, they're just not using it. So what McConnell could be doing if he wanted to play a hardball with these Democrats and punish them for obstructing for, for no purpose is to say, look, the, the actual text of Rule 22 says that post cloture, each senator has no more than one hour to speak. And if no senator is spe- seeking recognition to speak, we can call the vote. So effectively, he would require Democrats to actually talk. If they're going to obstruct, they have to use their debate time. And that would require, to use all of it, 30 different Democrat senators to come down and each speak for one hour. Very likely that Democrats are not going to be able to produce 30 senators. So maybe four or five come down, they each speak for an hour. And that means after four or five hours, we move to a vote. And those 30 hours become 10 or five or four or two, depending on how many Democrats show up. But McConnell has thus far refused to do this and is allowing Democrats to basically waste the Senate's time by demanding 30 hours and, and you know, not forcing them to use it. Does that make the sense? Vo- the voided time becomes obstruction time. Exactly. And McConnell could be doing a lot more to make them pay the price for that, but he has shown no interest in doing so. Well, let me ask you this. Is our, <laughs> McConnell has the ability to discipline senators when they misbehave. Is that right? Yes, you know, not in an overt way, but he has, you know, the tools to make their lives difficult. He can, you know, make sure they don't get critical fundraising opportunities. He can, uh, you know, bully them in front of their colleagues, which he is very fond of doing. Um, So he has sort of, um, you know, certain sort of social tactics at his disposal. The reason I ask is because if, if we have this debate time and they're not using it, then I would say I'm going to give you one last chance. If you don't use this debate time, then you will, you Democrats will be disciplined at the at the consequence of your fellow Democrats um, taking the. So we're going to take the debate time down to three hours. Period. And there's your ultimatum. You either use it. Or you lose it and you get three, period, in the report. Can I mean, can he discipline discipline the whole aisle that way? Well, he can say, you know, if you don't show up to speak, then I will call the vote. And then it's incumbent upon the Democrats to come down and speak. But he can only call the vote if no one else is, is, is seeking recognition to speak. So basically, what he could do, and to make it extremely painful, is say, look, we're going to run this time overnight. And so Democrats, you have to come speak for 30 hours overnight if you want to run all this time. If not, then, you know, send down who you want to speak. It is probably no more than four or five Democrats. And then we're moving to the vote. So he could he could put them in situations where obstruction becomes very painful and becomes very onerous to sustain. Right now, he's making it very easy on them. Well, I would also argue that there's another point by which he can discipline um, these people, because now we seem to be having uh you know hearings and so forth where they're attacking people already in the administration or about to be in the administration for several things and most of it is over religion and morality so now it's almost as though they are having a contest of which democrat has a more higher moral standard than the next democrat than the next democrat and the next democrat at the consequence uh and at the expense of somebody who is already in the administration or to be confirmed. So we're going after, uh, you know, what was your moral, you know, opinion on this or, uh, you know, isn't your religion getting in your way kind of thing, right? Yeah, we've seen that a number of times, uh, you know, with Democrats attacking nominees for their Christian faith, you know, calling them anti-Muslim because they happen to be a Christian, uh, attacking judges for their Catholic faith. And all of this is not only, you know, improper, but it's also unconstitutional. I mean, the Constitution makes very clear that there shall be no religious test for serving in the government or holding political office. And yet that's exactly what they're doing to these Trump nominees. You know, I think one of the worst character assassinations in, in relatedly that we've seen was what John Tester did to Dr. Ronnie Jackson, who was Trump's nominee to lead the, the VA. Uh, you know, Tester spread these completely unverified allegations about 
Ronnie Jackson um, that, that later turned out to be false. But it wasn't until after the media had reported them like they were true. You know, Jackson withdrew his nomination and his reputation was essentially in tatters over these allegations that were falsely spread by a U.S. senator. And that is a new level of character assassination that we haven't seen. Uh, and one hopes that we don't see it again because it's completely improper behavior from a sitting senator. Well, I would argue they got away with it. And he got away with it not only because of, of McConnell, but because of media. But you know, I was actually shocked at the exchange that went on when they were um, confirming Mike Pompeo for um, Secretary of State. Uh, Cory Booker went after him. I mean, he literally tarred and feathered Mike Pompeo. I didn't know how else Mike Pompeo was supposed to answer the questions, you know, a, a, about his faith, about uh, um uh, Planned Parenthood and, you know, all those kinds of things, which has got really nothing to do with being Secretary of State, right? I think that's exactly right. And we're seeing this in a lot of different areas now. You know, you saw um, the Deputy Director of OMB nominee, Russ Vogt, sort of famously attacked for his uh, Christian faith by Bernie Sanders and Dick Durbin. Well, I'm not sure what, you know, his Christian faith has to do with crunching numbers at the Office of Management and Budget, but apparently it was relevant. And, you know, this is the trend we're seeing. It's far less about people's qualifications or what their actual job will be and more about sort of these tangential issues that are, you know, being sort of spun out of context uh, in a really inappropriate way. So what are we little people out here supposed to do? Are we supposed to just get on social media and go after the Diane Feinsteins, the Durbins, the Sanders, the Bookers, and, you know, that crowd and the testers and go, uh, what, you know, what are you doing? I mean, this is unacceptable. Or, you know, just we hope that these candidates that are up for re-election, um, you know, do some opposition research and come out with these TV commercials that go, let me show you how, you know, what's the subject Cory Booker and Bernie Sanders did. I mean, are we just wait for you know, 30 second TV spots. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do think it's worthwhile to call attention to these issues because I do think, you know, right now they're going on with impunity to some extent. You know, I think it's up to Americans, you know, who are bothered by this to say so. But I also think, you know, not only making it plain to Democrats that this is just not acceptable behavior, I do think it's incumbent upon the Republican leadership to call this out too. I mean, uh, McConnell is the majority leader in the United States Senate. He needs to make plain uh, to his minority party, this is not behavior that is going to be tolerated from them and that there will be fallout, there will be punishment if Trump's nominees are continued to be treated with disrespect. Um, you know, there is a, a standard of behavior that he needs to uphold in the Senate, and thus far he's let it go on without comment. Well, you know, there was a brouhaha between uh, Trump and uh, Mitch McConnell a couple of months ago, and uh, McConnell had to go over to, to the White House and have, you know, some little confab over, you know, iced tea and, and, whether, uh, I mean, because Trump was on a full-blown assault of McConnell, but they came to some kind of accommodation and, and uh, everything was great. Uh, does, does Trump need to do that again? You know, I do think that he could press a little bit harder on McConnell. I think that's definitely something that could and possibly should happen. You've seen the White House come out and, and um, you know, push the Senate to work longer weeks, which is a pretty baseline. Uh, you know, maybe work four days instead of two and a half, if, if that's not asking too much. Uh, but I do think, you know, the White House could be asking for a little bit more. You know, if the Senate doesn't deliver, if it continues to drag its feet, they may start to. But thus far, they've kept their public comments to a minimum. Okay, so when um, a senator happens to not be in Washington, D.C., because they show up on a Monday night and they leave on a Thursday afternoon kind of thing, and, you know, whatever happens in, the, in between, um, what happens in their office? Are there, are there staff? You know, do they kind of go down to a skeleton staff too, or do do their DC offices have lights on, or do they just kind of go, well, go check my, you know, um, uh, Chicago office? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for the most part, the staff are on hand. You know, they're on call twenty four seven. They do work five days a week. Um, you know, they are the ones responsible for a lot of the constituent services and a lot of the policy work that goes on in those offices. So they do continue to show up to work. Uh, regardless of whether the member is there or not. So the perks are only really for the senators, not so much for the staff. <laughs> um, so are we to then determine that, I, I, I'm guessing that Mitch McConnell is really saying, well, they don't have to do this and that because they're really, the work is being done in committee. Is that an excuse that McConnell is necessarily using to um, give some leeway to these senators? To be honest, McConnell has not commented publicly on why yeah. he will not, you know, make the Senate work harder. 
Uh, I speculate that McConnell um, has faced some resistance within his conference. There, you know, these members are don't want to work five days. They want to work two and a half days a week. They want to be home on the, you know, early on the weekends. And, you know, McConnell, for whatever reason, doesn't want to press them. Um, he is in an elected position. He's the majority leader is an elected spot. The members put in there and, you know, it's possible he doesn't want to upset them for that reason. But publicly, McConnell has not addressed uh, a lot of these work week issues. Uh, what do you want us to do? <laughs> <laughs> I want I want all of us to start a campaign to make this make the Senate work again. I want them to work five days a week, and I would love them to, uh, you know, speed up some of these confirmations uh, by actually enforcing the Senate's rules. And I think that's something that you know it's a very sort of inside the Beltway argument, but it really does uh, go toward an end that I think ev- everyone can understand, which is that. Congress cannot implement Trump's agenda um, or get any other work done if they're not in town. And so starting with a five-day work week is a really basic first step uh, toward, toward making, making use of this unified government that we have, which we may not have for much longer. When it comes to these confirmations, Rachel, are we, I would say where we are at this point to help out Pompeo at state, we need some of these ambassadors. Um, is that one of the the bigger voids in all of this is the ambassadorship confirmations. The ambassadors are slowly ticking along. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of the lower level ambassadors confirmed. We just confirmed the ambassador to Germany last week. Uh, but where where I think they're really starting to hurt are these sort of political positions within the State Department uh, and lower level political positions throughout all the agencies. Because keep in mind, these are the positions that manage the career bureaucrats. So these political positions that are not confirmed. Uh, that means that bureaucrats are running the show. And a lot of these guys are not Trump supporters. In fact, they're the exact opposite. They're Democrats. And without the supervision of Trump's nominees, they're you know running roughshod over the president's agenda. And so what we really need is that mid-level uh, political appointments that are just languishing. 40% of Trump's nominees are still languishing in the Senate waiting for confirmation. I'm going to go back to a joint session of Congress when Obama was speaking, and I think it was on Obamacare, and he made some statement about illegals you know don't have access to obamacare and whatever and here comes congressman joe wilson with a you lie uh, and it turns out that he was exactly right but he got in real trouble under a nancy pelosi speakership not only was he essentially censured but they told him that he had to go on a national tour and apologize you know to you know whoever it was that they determined he needed to apologize and he nicely said look uh i apologized and I'm a Southern gentleman, and I apologize earnestly, but I'm not going to grovel. I'm not going to do that. So my point in even bringing that up is that um, if it was okay for Pelosi to do that to Joe Wilson, why can't McConnell do something like that to John Tester? It's a completely valid point, and I don't have a good rebuttal. I mean, I think oh, come it's, on. It is, Argue with me. <laughs> no, I, I am with you. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't know why he's not doing it. I, I can't rebut it. I don't know why he's not taking these actions because this is something I think a lot of uh, people want to see, not just for the sake of you know partisan politics, but for the sake of decency. You know, this is a a senator you know who has the platform and the standing uh, to get people to listen to him, and he used that platform to spread unverified lies that that you know turned out to be lies uh, to the press about. Uh, you know, a, a Navy admiral who served his country honorably under three presidents. Uh, and that has meant that, that his reputation is never going to recover. You know, what is written about him on the Internet is written in ink. And that's a really serious thing. And it, it shouldn't go, you know, unnoticed or unspoken about, you know, among the leadership here in, here in Washington. And now he's not even going to be the, the physician of record to the president. No, that's right. You know, he's sort of been taken out of the spotlight in that role, too. And all of this is because of, of the essentially lies that Tester spread about him. Uh, and he's been able to do so with impunity. He's not been, you know, punished or, or spoken to about it. And then we still don't have a leadership at the VA. So, I mean, it was kind of right. like a dual track, destruction, you know, search and destroy mission that was successful, I would argue. No, I think that's right. And, you know, the VA is, is the largest uh, agency in Washington. It needs management. It's caring for, you know, the, the people that have gone and, and fought in wars for us, American heroes in many cases. It needs, uh, you know, capable management. And Ronnie Jackson wasn't even allowed to get to his hearing, you know, to allow people to sort that out. And it's a real disappointment, I think, for a lot of people. 
Um, now, when you say, you know, these senators, you know, work two and a half, three days, not all of them are doing that, right? I mean, there are some that are certainly staying in their office or when they're not specifically in their office, you know, they may be traveling abroad on some kind of an envoy to Turkey or something, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, they do continue to do work. They just go home to their districts. Some of them do more work than others. Uh, but I think the point is, like, they need to be here doing the people's work, you know, in the legislature. Uh, more than they need to be, you know, Traveling on junkets, right? Yeah, <laughs> or you know, in parades back home. Yeah, I mean, I, I I see somebody like a, you know, Tom Cotton. I think he's working pretty pretty hard. Um, you know, yeah, I, the the younger senators are actually starting to notice this. They do want to do work. Uh, David Perdue, the senator from Georgia, held a press conference earlier this week that actually said, "Hey, we should stay in session longer. We should work harder." Um, so the younger guys get it. Um, but it, the message hasn't trickled up, I suppose. So do we get on social media and, and tap, you know, Dick Durbin on the shoulder and say, what gives? I think it's a fair question, but it's McConnell ultimately that controls the Senate floor and controls the Senate schedule. Uh, so it really isn't up to Dick Durbin. The obstruction is definitely part, part, partially his fault, but a lot of this is on McConnell and his scheduling uh, and management of the Senate. Uh, you know, David Perdue earlier this week at his press conference launched the hashtag Make Congress Work Again, uh, and that was trending for a little bit. So, you know, people are starting to pay attention and starting to notice that, you know, their Congress, their representative government isn't doing anything these days. Well, we've covered some reasons to be mad um, at McConnell in the Senate. Um, are there any others that necessarily come to mind that, that um, have, you know, been parked in your lap that you're angry about, that we should be well, angry I about? <laughs> <laughs> I do think that one related uh, note about sort of the Senate schedule that, that may be um, concerning to people that are concerned about fiscal issues is, you know, we just saw this giant $1.3 trillion omnibus uh -huh. jammed through, right, that no one read, uh, no one had time to read. And the Congress is at risk of running into that problem again if they don't start addressing their funding legislation uh, before they go home for the August recess. Um, we are coming up on the deadline of September 30th, uh, and we're going to be in that exact situation again, where the bill will be dropped on people's heads on September 29th, and they'll be told to pass it or shut the government down. Um, so Congress really does need to start working on these issues now if we want to see them done with transparency and responsibility. Yeah, uh, that's a big one, because that August recess is a fairly long one, is it not? It's the whole month of August. Yeah, it's you know, so Labor Day, right? Right. And then the Senate's only going to be in session for a couple of weeks after that, because most of the, the rest of the year will be spent on campaign trail. So and then, you know, after November, we come back to a lame duck uh, where, you know, you have a number of senators who've just been defeated, uh, still voting on legislation. And that is not the time that you want to consider, consider a government funding bill. Uh, those guys are in no position to vote on principle at that point. Well, Rachel Bovard, you've explained it all very well. You kind of put things in context for us because, I mean, you know, unless we sit around and watch C-SPAN all day long, we don't have a hint. But yet there's a lot of things happening in hallways or not happening in hallways that should be happening in hallways or meetings or offices. And so we're very, very happy that you brought this to our attention because uh, we, we, we don't understand when they're in D.C. and they're not in D.C. And when they're in D.C., they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing or they're stonewalling or they're obstructing or they're not voting or they're supposed to be in a 30-hour debate and nobody shows up. I know. It's any number of things. <laughs> well, you've done a good job in explaining that to us. So we certainly appreciate that, Rachel. And um, you know, thanks for explaining it and writing the article on it and come back soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, more coming up. Stay with us. Hi, thank you for listening. My name is Ron Phillips, and I'm the owner and operations manager of Talk America Radio. It is with great pride that I offer you this 24-7 stream of some of the finest talk radio programming in the country, but I need your support. We are a listener-supported network. That means we need your help to continue to offer the quality programming you're hearing right now. If you're able, please visit talkamericaradio.us and click the Support Us button. Your donation will go a long way in helping us continue to share the American voice. Thank you. This is Don Newen, co-host of the Drive Time Sit Rep. Join me as I call in to my intel analyst, Denise Simon, for my daily situation report or sit rep, the Drive Time Sit Rep. 
Check TalkAmericaRadio.us for more information and showtimes. Let me talk to you, black people. When you vote for blacks and put them in office under the banner of the Democrat Party, please explain to me what black people get as a result. This was not a nap that we have been taking. We are in a coma. You know what the interesting thing about pensions is? That's today's money given to people who ain't doing nothing for you today. Get off that black Democrat tit that they've been sucking on. Your country is being stolen from you, and the promise is being stolen from your children, and they're telling you it's all right, while the rest of the world is trying to lap us. Well, why are we doing so poorly? Two words, teachers' unions. Are you kidding me? Black Man Thinking, Monday nights, 9 p.m. This is Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience. When I'm not debating with Donna Fiducio about politics, I listen to Cowboy Logic Radio. Why, you ask? Because outside of my blog, founderscode.com, and my own radio show, the Denise Simon Experience, Cowboy Logic is by far the most entertaining and informative radio show on planet Earth. Plus... Don makes me feel guilty if I don't listen to his radio show every week. (laughs) You're listening to your local news source, WLBB, News Talk 1330 and FM 106.3. ATA Digital Dallas, Talk America Radio. Simulcasting on WDDQ, Talk 92.1, Adel Valdosta, Georgia, and WJHC, Talk 107.5, Jasper, Florida. And thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Um... Raise your hand if you know that the entire month of May is Military Appreciation Month. Um, You'd have to look kind of hard in certain places to see if the media is telling you all of that and and giving you some um, stories. But um, in case they're not, my buddy here, um, Major Scott Husing, uh, former Marine and the proud author of Echo and Ramadi, a first-hand story of the U.S. Marines in Iraq's deadliest city is with us. Congratulations still on the book. I know that you're traveling all over the place promoting the book. How's that going, Mr. Scott? It's going great, and thanks for having me back on the program, Denise. Always a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, I've been very busy uh, traveling, uh, doing a lot of veteran support um, appearances, and just got back from D.C., to honor some of my fellow veterans and and the the outfit that I I fought with, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, is they celebrated the 50th anniversary of a historic battle of Daido, Vietnam. So 50 years they've been telling their story, and I can only imagine, because I've been telling this one with uh, Echo Company in Ramadi, uh, you know, for just over a year now, and... um, yeah, the book just came out two months ago, but 50 years these guys have been telling this story. It's just amazing to be a well, part of that. With it so is. I saw, it, I saw your text in 50 years, and I looked at it for a second and said, 50 years? I mean, I, you, you just kind of wonder. I mean, it, it's either Vietnam is way, way in the past, or it was just a few years ago. It's either one or the other, and 50 just doesn't kind of fit in there. And we don't realize that the you know the people that were in um, in uh, Vietnam, they're they're climbing up there in age, aren't they? Well, it was it was so historic. Yeah, they're they're in their seventies now. And um, the battalion commander of Second Battalion, Fourth Marines, Brigadier General William Wild Bill Weiss, uh, just turned eighty nine <gasps> this last March. And so he's always um, been a supporter of uh, me as the president of their association and of Echo and Ramadi. Uh, he wrote a very nice blurb for the book. And, you know, he's still crushing it. 
And we were surrounded by all these icons in D.C. and in Quantico, Virginia, uh, which, you know, is where we make Marine officers. And guys like Vic Taylor, who started the infantry officer training program, and Major General James Livingston, Medal of Honor recipient, and uh, now Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis who's also a proud, magnificent bastard of 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines. And so to be surrounded by all these people, and also my very first commandant of the Marine Corps, General Al Gray, spoke on May 1st, and I gave him a a small award, and I never thought as an 18, 19-year-old Lance Corporal I would have the privilege of standing there handing an impact award for leadership to my very first commandant, who is now also, I think, 89 or, or 90 years old. And he and doesn't still, look it. He doesn't look it no. at all. He looks like oh, he, he might looks, be 68. No, both General Weiss and, and General Gray are sharp as attack, and I think that's attributed to, you know, they're just, they're just continuing to lead, and they are, uh, you know, continuing to stay motivated and connected to veterans and, and really giving back throughout their entire lives. Now, Scott, there's got to be, you know, for we little girls out here and those that didn't serve in, in the military, there has to be some DNA that, that, you know, military is born with and then it is, you know, some seed is planted there, and then it just has continued to grow and and mature and mature and mature. It just never goes away because it's kind of like um, that culture. I don't think ever leaves the psyche. It it doesn't leave the lifestyle, does it? Well, I think one of the things after this past event, which was really unique for me, was to understand that you're right. Le- leadership doesn't stop when you leave the military. It certainly didn't stop when I left Ramadi or the military. I continued to lead. And, and as I stood amongst so many icons um, in D.C., you really realize the word impact. And, and for many that I was surrounded by in that audience at the National Archives in Quantico, that word impact has a literal meaning. You know, some, some had been impacted by bullets or maybe a swift boot from their sergeant or a blast of a rocket pill grenade. But, you know, there are other words to describe these, and I, and I hope I can get away with saying magnificent bastards because that was our call oh. sign, but these leaders and Marines that I was honored to stand beside, they, they really understand words like love and compassion and kindness and caring that, you know, aren't taught to us in the schools professional warriors attend. But those are the words that great leaders read between the lines. And by using those words through their actions in Vietnam or in in Ramadi and knowing all right when it was tough, you know, all right to be tough on the Marines or put their armor on them. Those were the great ones. You know, as I stood there among those examples like Livingston and Gray and Weiss and Jones and Taylor, and they put those words into action so many times, not just by those I just mentioned, but by the hundreds of warriors that we memorialized and honored there at the National Archives and in Quantico, whether again, in the jungles of Vietnam or the streets of Iraq, uh, each time, through their actions and their love and their understanding and their sacrifices, they made an impact. And, you know, you often don't see that immediate impact as a leader. Sometimes it takes 10 years, in my case, or 20 or 50 to understand that you've made an impact. And some think it, those days pass you by, but the leadership I was surrounded by last week endured, again, long after they left the battlefield And there's no expiration date on your warrant or commission. And I'm continually surrounded by these people in these organizations that are examples of what real leaders are. And their leadership continues to this day. And they certainly made an impact on me. Major, what's kind of cool is that if there is any kind of uh, military um, assignment or if there's a call to action in the civilian life, and you got somebody that is prior military sitting there, they step up, they don't say no. Um, and when they, and you know, that's certainly part of leadership, but they're, they're, they're not bashful about saying, okay, take me, here I am, um, I'll do this. And then 
it is really kind of a remarkable skill, a remarkable attribute that um, they can force multiply in the civilian world just like would necessarily happen in um, in military world, right? Oh, I, I agree 100%. And I, I don't care whether you study Covey or Clausewitz about leadership. Those basic tenets um, of being a leader, I don't think are exclusive to the military, but military stories and the, the things that people in the military, and, and again, I don't care if you're in combat or not, um, you know, being in combat doesn't make you a better leader if you've been blown up or shot at, because real leaders lead in any condition. But our our experience under the worst conditions, I think, gives us a different perspective on, you know, even that worst day in the private sector, I always I always tell people, well, no one's bleeding, right? So it can't be that bad. So I I think we tend to look at things through a different lens. And we do have that certain strand of DNA in us, I guess, that we're able to overcome some of those challenges and look at things through a different lens. And we come from this segment of society, again, as people who are kind of protectors, you know, that want to help people that can't take care of themselves. And I think there is a small segment of the population that are willing to do that. And our nation's veterans and those that serve on active duty in our military are definitely very emblematic of what I refer to as, you know, this small segment of protectors. Well put. Um, so, you know stories of uh, your fellow Marines, but you traveling around in, in um, promoting your book, Echo and Ramadi, and meeting some others, come up and shake your hand. You're hearing some other stories that uh, are, are any of those kind of setting you back a little bit, kind of go, I had no idea? Absolutely. I get emails and instant messages from so many people, total strangers at times, that uh, reach out to me. And again, I think I use that word impact because they continue to make an impact on me. And, um, you know, I shared a, a recent story from uh, a staff sergeant in the army that reached out to me in an email and he he said in the email sir i'm i'm probably sure you don't even remember me my name is staff sergeant phil morehouse um but i was there the night that corporal libby was shot in ramadi and i raced across the street on route michigan to the combat outpost and i remember your convoy driving in that night and i remember the sound of the brakes and I remember the dust cloud and I remember your Marines carrying Corporal Libby and mm -hmm. I remember the look on their faces and I remember the look on your face and I remember every single step you took as you tried to make your way into the aid station and he goes on in the email to say he, he hadn't thought about those things in almost 12 years and he finished the email by saying yes we, we made a difference and you know to see that reflection from a guy that I'd passed probably dozens of times, this faceless, nameless soldier who reached out to me that I had made an impact on was really something remarkable that, again, you don't see when you're writing a book or when you're leading Marines in combat. It, it sometimes takes a, a decade for those stories to come back to you. And if Phil's story is one, it's it's one of hundreds that I've received that I'm completely humbled and very honored to receive it's it's just a remarkable connection that again is so emblematic of our nation's military that they're so selfless they raise their hand and serve day in and day out um, you know separated from their families um, and spend countless hours away in training and during workups for deployments, they, they really are the best that our nation has to offer. And during Military Appreciation Month, it's especially important that you not only reach out to our veterans, but the families that support yeah. them. The, you know, for every one guy that goes down range or, 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 or woman, they leave behind a family, these kids and husbands and wives. And they're equally as important because we certainly couldn't have done what we did in Ramadi and fought under those conditions without the unconditional support of our families back home. 
you know, and I believe that that a lot of that um, kind of gets imparted into the other members of the family. Um, so, you know, a wife or a son or a daughter, they're necessarily first to step up too, because I mean, it's kind of like that little seed gets passed off to the, the other family members. So, um, you know, well, you're you, part of that. You're part of that. You you understand that uh, better than anybody is. Uh, yeah. You 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 do become indoctrinated into this That's military a good word. family. Yeah, yeah. You you do I, almost. You know, and and you don't get a choice in it. That's the thing is we raise our hand and we take an oath. But you know the the sons and daughters and the wives and husbands they don't get a vote. They they're along for the ride. And sometimes it's very rocky. And that's why you know there's so many days throughout this month that we recognize not only those who serve, but also, you know, Military Spouse Appreciation Day, um, which uh, is today. So to all the military spouses, uh, happy Military Spouse Appreciation Day. It is May 11th. And then coming up, we have May 19th is Armed Forces Day. And then May 28th is Memorial Day, that special day where we remember those that gave the ultimate sacrifice and commemorate the men and women who died in military service. And we take time to really take stock of the true meaning of the word sacrifice. Indeed, that's that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, you'd have to go over to TV or you're going to have to to something like the American Heroes Channel or you're going to have to go pick up a book like echo and ramadi just to you know uh, hear the stories or have things put in context for you um because we don't you know we get little snippets uh you know israel and iran are about to go after it uh or we you know captured these terrorists over here at the border of syria or this is what went on in afghan in in kabul or you know wherever else um but we don't we're not in the moment we don't smell the smells we don't hear those sounds we can't see the, the the expressions on the faces we don't know the sweat we don't know what happens when they get back to barracks um or camp or you know this broke down this i mean so uh, it's it, <sighs> military is always resourceful they're always thoughtful um and we get to, we ha we miss a lot of that i think you know if it you'd have to go back and watch Patton I mean, for any for any movie to really kind of um, tell you the way it was. But that was a very long time ago. We don't really fight those kind of wars anymore. And those on Vietnam, those kinds of movies, a lot of those are don't paint any of that in a good light. And there's very little out there when it comes to, you know, early Afghanistan or um, Iraq, right? There are very few books that or even movies that capture that essence that you just described the that visceral feeling of you know like i describe in echo and that that friction that indescribable pressure or what it is like to make those life and death decisions at a split second for these young men and women who are serving in combat or even you know, in our in our Navy or Air Force that have to equip and provide all of the support to that one individual Marine on the ground, those guys in the infantry that I served with uh, for so many years, you know, for like one grunt on the ground, Denise, it's uh, like nine other people to support that, that one soldier Marine, all of those components. And that's why I always say to every veteran that your service matters. Um, whether you're turning a wrench on a truck or pumping gas or scraping paint on a ship, I don't care. You're part of the team, and you should be absolutely proud of your service. And I think that we do need more stories about this current fight and this contemporary subject that we're talking about, because you're right. In, in the headlines on mainstream media, it's always the quick soundbite of the day, and we're not really capturing the real stories. And that's why I'm really proud to not only be a part of your program, but so many others that are highlighting these great American heroes, because I'm no hero, Denise. The, the real ones are the Marines and soldiers that 
I was privileged to command and those who I fought alongside and those who gave their lives to protect their fellow Marines and, and soldiers, they're, they're the real heroes. And I make no mistake about that. And to understand that is really something that the general American people need to understand is you can watch what you want to watch on TV or in cinema, but we're not. Yeah, I, yeah no. Uh, it, you know, it's kind of remarkable. Um, I watched a documentary not all too long ago about Schwarzkopf and um, Operation Desert Storm 1. And it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was really it, it it was really kind of fascinating on how that whole thing transpired and he went in he went in there with such overkill just nobody had to even fire the first you know 7 inch cannon because the the picture of of what was in front of the the enemy would have been so intimidating. They just threw down their arms. We're out of here. We <laughs> and and then after it's all over with, those generals always want to kind of get in the last word to their enemy, uh, to to their the, you know their command, the, their opposing commanders. It's really it, it it's fascinating. But you mentioned something here a, a minute ago, Scott, and I'm glad that you did because. I don't think that um, the listening audience necessarily appreciates either the government contractors that are in the same battle space as you guys. Um, mm. You know, the Dine Corps or the Triple Canopies or, you know, any of those that have to, you know, make sure that the trucks are going where they need to go, the fuel tanks and, and you know, the beds and the tires and the sheets and the and the washing machines and, you know, all those kinds of things. We don't think of any of that, do we? No, and that's a, that's a great point because although they, get, they do get paid very well to take on those type of risks um, from those companies, um, to name a few, um, they, they, again, are a, a segment of, you know, the general uh, industrial machine that are kind of willing to step up and help support. And obviously, they're making profit uh, off of, you know, our tax dollars and those that we get to supplement that to support our nation's military overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. But to, to volunteer to be uh, someone that sets up barriers in Iraq or runs a chow hall or provides uh, equipment support or parts and supplies, that's not your everyday run-of-the-mill American that's willing to risk that. And mm -hmm. you're right. They should be recognized as well. Absolutely. And a lot of them are former military. True. They're, they're kind of drawn to it. And uh, it, for some, you know, it's kind of hard to hang up the rifle for whatever reasons. And they they soon find that they have that calling in them still. So they find other ways to serve. And I think uh, whether you're in uniform or out of uniform and you're participating in uh, a named operation overseas as we continue to fight in Iraq and Afghanistan, these wars are still going on, as we know in, in, in the media. Um, th they should be recognized because it, it takes a lot of sacrifice, again, to be ripped away from your family and again, they, they do it for different reasons, but I think there's still a connection to the military and a willingness to serve. So if you end up over at, you know, a veterans hall uh, on Memorial Day weekend and they're all sitting around, you know, eating uh, fried chicken and having a beer, are, aren't those conversations they have with each other some of the more remarkable conversations that you would think um, where they're, they're appreciating each other you know whether they were air force or whether they were guard or or um uh army oh absolutely and i think we've talked about this before too niece is that it's such a small segment of the american population that serve and then even smaller are those that serve in combat and see the worst that war has to offer or that humanity has to offer and when they do get the chance to get together in a in a safe environment and share those stories, I think that's where a lot of the real healing happens. Uh, I witnessed it again just last week at the 50th uh, commemoration of Dai Do, where I sat and spoke to General Livingston's wife, Sarah, and 
few remarks as we sat and chatted for a good 45 minutes to an hour about how this process for them to be able to share their stories really only happened within the last 10 years. And I mm -hmm. thought, wow, you know, that's remarkable to carry that around for 40 years and then just be able to start talking and sharing at age whatever, 65 instead of 75. Or, you know, I, I can't imagine that because it's taken my guys at least 10, 11 years before I could share this story. And I'm sure there's there's plenty more stories that are going to come out of this long war that we're in right now. But um, those stories are great. And some are stories of sadness, of course, but some are hilarious. And, oh, they have you know, to the, be. The levity of it all under the worst uh, circumstances. And yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example of that is uh, I was recently in Denver doing a book signing at Tattered Cover. And one guy in the back of the room, he raised his hand during the question and answer, and he asks me, sir, what do you miss most about it? And uh, he kind of stumped me. And I, I didn't, I don't think I gave him a really good answer. And then I turned it around on him. I said, what do you miss the most? And I stumped him back. But as he came through the line and handed me his book to sign, he kind of leaned over and he said, those uncontrollable moments of laughter during the lull in a long patrol. And it didn't hit me at first. And I was like, that's what he missed the most is that, that shared brotherhood and the camaraderie Harmony. where you, yeah. you know, it's just the worst, but you, you laugh about something <laughs> stupid on the battlefield. Well, again, um, ladies and gentlemen, Scott Husing, uh, Echo and Ramadi. Um, it's a real collection of stories and, and we're trying to, you know, certainly continue to impart some because there's, there's, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands that still remain untold. So I, I suspect that um, Scott's got a, another book in his future because uh, he needs to go on and collect some letters and, and some other stories. So uh, you, you need to come out with um, version two. But thank you, Scott, for being with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Uh, and thank great. You. And thanks for, yeah, thanks for highlighting it. And um, as we continue this Military Appreciation Month, I'll be honored to be speaking at the Reagan Ranch Center Ooh. on May 18th and then hey. on Memorial Day at the Nixon Library in Loma Linda. So if, if fans want to come out and get their book signed, I'll be Reagan Ranch, May 18th, Nixon Center, uh, Nixon Library on uh, the 28th of Memorial Day and right. be speaking and signing. Congratulations. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us. And we'll see you again very, very soon.